In the previous episode of the Knife and Fork Show, we talked about school lunch standards and the influence they have over what our kids eat. This time we're going to talk about another big issue that influences what our kids eat, and that's the marketing of food to children. Joining me again is Margot Wutan, Nutrition Policy Director for the Center for Science and the Public Interest, one of the most influential consumer advocacy groups on the issue of food policy. The percentage of children aged 6 to 11 years in the United States who were obese was 7% in 1980. By 2008, that number had grown to nearly 20%. Of course, when we talk about obesity, we're not talking about chubby. We're talking about a serious health condition that can lead to all kinds of complications, both today and in future years. More than a year ago, four of our regulatory agencies, the Federal Trade Commission, FDA, USDA, and the CDC, all got together and calling themselves the Interagency Working Group, released some draft voluntary guidelines for the industry to follow in relation to advertising food to children. Then, back in October, there was a hearing where the House of Representatives called in these agencies to talk about their guidelines. It was not a pleasant discussion. What happened, Margo? It was a very interesting hearing. The, the food industry opposed these voluntary guidelines more than anything else that I've ever worked on in my time working on nutrition policy. It was really quite surprising. I thought this was a little bill that Senator Harkin and I worked on together that would just be giving some advice to food companies and entertainment companies on how they could do a little better, how they could improve their self-regulation for food marketing to kids. It wasn't backdoor regulation. It wasn't a requirement at all. And yet the food and entertainment companies pulled out all the stops and lobbied very aggressively against these mere suggestions for how they could improve on food marketing to kids. Now the complaints that I recall from the hearing were too rigid, that these voluntary guidelines would not be really voluntary, um, that uh, people would, uh, would file suits against food companies and use the guidelines as sort of the parameters of the lawsuits. Um, what, do you, what do you say to the people who have those specific criticisms about the, uh, the action? Well, they had lots of criticisms, but none of them had any basis in fact. For example, backdoor regulation. They said, you know, once the government proposes these voluntary suggestions, they'll kind of automatically pass themselves into law, or they'll be blackmailed. They'll go into the FTC for some other issue really related to enforcement or, um, you know, commerce. And then the FTC will say, well, until you follow these standards, we're not going to grant this other thing that you want. They, they really over... I don't know, they really overblew blew the whole thing of, mm -hmm. you know, saying that these were regulations, positioning them as regulations. I think a lot of members of Congress who were lobbied by the industry thought these were regulations and didn't even realize that they were voluntary. And uh, then another thing happened roughly a year after this, right? They had uh, the Institutes of Medicine published this 460 page, 462 page report that made multiple recommendations that went even further than the IWG. Um, and that report, which came out in conjunction with um, the HBO documentary series, Way to the Nation, which you appear in, um, it suggests, for example, recommending schools ban access to sugar-sweetened beverages, excise tax to funnel revenue to obesity prevention programs, guidelines for children and teens uh, 2 to 17 that match dietary guidelines, um, extending standards to digital marketing, internet, use of licensed characters and toys, and then this one, this was the one that uh, seemed to be the stickiest of the, of the recommendations. The language says, if such marketing standards have not been adopted within two years by a substantial majority of food, beverage, restaurant, and media companies that market foods and beverages to children and adolescents, policymakers at the local, state, and federal, level should, federal levels should consider setting mandatory nutritional standards for marketing to this age group to ensure that such standards are implemented. Um, this went even further than the IWG suggested and um, we haven't seen anything come out of uh, a response to the IOM report yet, have we? Well, these public health experts looked at the evidence, and the evidence is really clear. Food marketing affects what children want to eat, what they're willing to eat, what they do eat, and it affects their diets and their health. It really helps to shape what kids think of as food and has a very negative effect on their health because the overwhelming majority of foods that are marketed to kids are unhealthy. And so they came up with a number 
of strong recommendations to address this. What we've been doing instead is asking companies to do the right thing. And so for the last five or six years, we've been meeting with companies, encouraging them to adopt guidelines for food marketing on their own voluntarily. And a number of big companies have done it. Some company standards are better than others, but they're all moving toward a uniform set of standards that they themselves have written. The problem is not all companies belong. So some big companies like you know, Chuck E. Cheese and Topps Candy, IHOP, a bunch of restaurants, aren't participating in self-regulation at all. For entertainment companies, Disney has stepped up and is going to make some good changes. But Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network are basically saying anything goes. Whatever the food companies want to place on their, on their channels is fine. And then the nutrition standards that the companies have adopted, which they say are so strong, consider popsicles, SpaghettiOs, Cocoa Puffs, Reese's Puffs, all these sugary cereals to be healthy food. So they say they're doing the right thing. They say they want to do the right thing. And then they tell us Cocoa Puffs are healthy. You know, it just isn't credible. It's not believable. Any parent knows SpaghettiOs and popsicles aren't healthy foods. You could have them occasionally, but they shouldn't be considered as healthy foods to market to kids. Yeah. It sounds like there's a big divide between the food industry and the people who are advocating for these kinds of standards? Well, I thought that food marketing was a really important area that we needed to address based on the science. But after seeing the industry's reaction to mere voluntary suggestions, I now know it's one of the most important areas mm -hmm. that we need to address if we're going to have any chance of addressing obesity. All right. So what's going to happen next? What are we looking for to happen next in this area? Well, so we haven't given up on self-regulation. So we're asking the companies to adopt stronger nutrition standards, cover all their media, and asking the entertainment companies, Nickelodeon especially, to step up and do the right thing. That it's not fair to parents that companies are trying to turn their kids against them. It's not that the parents can't say no, but why should you have to deal with the hassle of your kids regularly nagging you for food that's going to make them sick? Um, we're talking to the Obama administration about what the options are. I think it'll depend on what happens with the election, what the next administration will be willing to do. Right. Um, but I think it's an important area that we will continue to make a top priority. Okay. Well, there is something supposed to come out from the FTC in the near, very near future, correct? Yeah. So a couple of years ago, we worked with Senator Harkin on a bill that required the FTC to do a report on the amount of marketing to kids and the types of foods that are marketed. And that was really the first look ever at what the food marketing landscape looks like. Now the FTC is doing an update, an update on that study. So we'll be able to see how well self-regulation is really working from the, this first study before self-regulation was, was in place. It was back in August 2008? It was. And, and it's based on 2006 marketing expenditures. Right. And these are the actual data from the companies They got themselves. the companies to give them numbers. They did. Yeah. And so now we'll have 2009 data, and we'll see from 2006 to 2009 what's happened. Which foods are marketed? Has that changed? How much marketing is there through which kinds of channel, you know, TV versus the internet versus what's in schools? Okay. So I think it'll be really interesting. Right now, you have the food and entertainment companies saying, we're doing a great job, we've made so many changes on food marketing. And then you have parents and health experts saying, wait a minute, you know, we've seen the studies, it shows that still the overwhelming majority of ads to kids are for unhealthy foods. What they say, what parents see is very different. Right. Um, well, that's it. That's all the time we have for this segment. Thanks to Margot Wutan for joining us twice on the Knife and Fork Show. Hopefully, IMDb will now add Knife and Fork Show to your list of credits. <laughs> um, we're not done talking about marketing food to children, however. Our next guest will be somebody who is familiar with that from the industry perspective and what the industry is doing to police itself. <laughs>